Starting Shakespeare's sonnets today, and I just need to do, I'm going to say a little bit of background, but it'll probably actually end up be most of the time. Um, let me just give you some dates real quickly. So we've already talked about Shakespeare's birth and death dates, 423, 1564 to 423, 1616, right? In 1582, he marries Anne Hathaway, another one. In 83, um, this, I believe, was November. This is February of 83. His daughter, or Susanna, is born. In 85, the twins, Hamnet, in Judith, Hamnet, right? not Hamlet, Hamnet and Judith are born from 85 to 92. I'll talk about this in a, month, in a minute. These are kind of called the lost years. Uh, did I talk about that? 96, Hamnet dies. 99, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, so if you want to just put this down. We have a globe, 1601, his father, John, dies. Um, well, for purposes of what we're going to talk about. 1609, the sonnets. 16, Shakespeare dies, 1623, Folio and Anne dies. Okay, so let me talk about all of that for a few minutes before we get into uh, the sonnets. So, this will be a good one. 11, 15, 6, 82. Fifteen eighty-two. So, born in Stratford on Avon, which is about ninety miles. I think it is ninety hundred miles northwest of London, out in the states. Okay, um, it's a Catholic area of England. Shakespeare's family. Old time Catholic, right? Um, and probably even after the Reformation and stuff, and even during the 1560s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it's pretty indication they were probably still Catholic leaning, put it that way, okay? Um, 1582, he marries Anne Hathaway. Anybody know anything about their marriage? She was older. She was 26. Notice, Shakespeare was 18. All right? <coughs> and three months later, she has their first child. Shotgun wedding. Okay? Their wedding did not occur in the parish church in Stratford. Um, it occurred I remember, one or two counties away. At the time that Shakespeare lived, you had a practice in the English church called the band. <clears throat> and the bands were, when someone went, when a couple were going to get married, the rector of the church, the priest of the church, would stand up and say, three successive weeks before the marriage. Right? Three successive weeks, or once every three months. Three successive weeks. So three successive weeks before the three consecutive weeks before the marriage. The priest would say, you know, so and so and so and so are going to be married on such and such a day. 
If there's anyone who has any reason why they should not get married, let him speak now or forever hold his peace. You know, that part that is in the, the, so to, the so-called, you know, uh, wedding service today for, you know, a lot of Protestants and such. So, that wasn't performed for Shakespeare and Anne. And we think it's because, according to one uh, biographer, Jesus took some kind of a pitch to Shakespeare. David, no, can't remember. Um, he suggests that Shakespeare got essentially a dispensation from the church, an agreement from the church not to do that because Anne was already pregnant and because his father uh, had been mayor of Stratford, though by this time he kind of fallen from glory, so to speak. Right? His father was a glover and cotton um, and something to do with wool. So the bands apparently were not performed. So, daughter Susanna is born in 83. She will later go on and marry a doctor, has his first grandchild, etc., etc. Oh, by the way, there are no living descendants of Shakespeare. They died out by the end of the 17th century. So, by 1700, no Shakespeare relatives alive. All right? Same thing happened to another major Renaissance poet, John Donne. John Milton doesn't have any. It's, it's like they spent all their genes in their writing. <laughs> and they had bad genetics or whatever. Right? Two years later, about a year and a half actually, in 85, Hamnet and Judith are born. The twins, Hamnet, um, the son, right? And then 85 to 92 are collectively called either the lost years or the dark years. And here's why. It's like Shakespeare drops off the world map. He disappears. See, we have a birth, a baptismal certificate after he was born. We don't have a birth certificate. We have a baptismal certificate. We've got the marriage certificate. We've got the birth certificate for Susanna and for the other two children. And then in 1585, no references. Nothing. We hear nothing about Shakespeare for seven years. <clears throat> in the mid-16th century, excuse me, mid-17th century, beginning about the 1630s, 1640s, stories start to crop up of what Shakespeare was doing during, during these five, uh, seven years. One of the theories, he traveled the continent. And that's where he picked up stories that would become main themes, main plots of his plays. Okay? Um, we know some of the, for example, some of the source materials for some of his plays were only known in the original languages. For example, French and Italian. They weren't translated into English. So Shakespeare had to have known French and Italian, right, in order to write some of his plays because the basic plots were available in French. Nothing Shakespeare wrote was original. The whole idea of, you know, poetic originality, that is a thoroughly modern construction. In, in Shakespeare's day, it's kind of like, you know, if you could take something somebody else has written, modify it, change it, you know, et cetera, and make it even better, more power to you. Today, that's kind of called plagiarism, right? So, uh, what else? Um, there's speculation that he was a school teacher or headmaster of a school. There's speculation. This one, you know, has a little more circumstantial evidence to support it, that he was a member of a traveling acting company, okay, working in the provinces. Um, there is speculation he was a secretary to somebody, right? No proof for any of this. What we do know is in 1592, a guy named Thomas Robert. Let me go right down. It's Robert. 
guy named Green, his last name, writes this little pamphlet called A Gross Worth of Wit, and it's got something else in it, where he's kind of knocking the new and upcoming writers in London. Um, Green is what's called a university wit. University wit. And what that means is he's one of the graduates of the universities, and he's kind of an intellectual. He's a writer, right? Well, there are a lot of these guys, right? And he's dying when he writes it. And what he's doing is he's taking his dying parting shots at the people who have started replacing him as a writer. Now, he's a hack. The only reason anybody reads anything written by Green today is because it's assigned in a graduate level 16th century literature course, or they're trying to find something for a dissertation topic that nobody else has written about. Usually when you do that kind of approach to finding a dissertation topic, there's a reason nobody else has written about it when the guy's been dead for over 400 years. It's because it's not worth writing about. Anyways, in this gross, gross worth of wit, he refers to this guy who fancies himself the greatest shake scene in a country. Right? Shake, and then scene, and he has another one, another word that's a combination like that that has spear in it. And then he actually has quotations from a couple of Shakespeare's plays. It's clear he's referring to Shakespeare. Everybody says he's referring to Shakespeare. And then we also have late 1592, Shakespeare's first play being produced. Comedy of Errors, reference to it, right? And after 1592, I mean, he's got plays going. At this point, he's also part, well, from 1592 on, He's part of the Lord Chamberlain Men, which is an acting company, right? The Lord Chamberlain is like the second highest ranking person in society. The Lord Chamberlain was the person who assisted the Queen. Shakespeare is a member of this acting company, right? He also gets stock options. He owns partially this company. The Lord Chamberlain was the patron. So if they got in trouble, the Lord Chamberlain can, you know, smooth things out, right? 1596, Hamnet dies. Notice. He's only 11 years old. Okay, by the way, from 1592 on, Shakespeare's in London. We know where he lived. We have things to talk about where he lived. Later on, I don't have it written down here, but in 1613, he buys a property, okay? So Hamnet dies, and beginning around 98 or so, some of his plays kind of start to take a darker turn. In 1599, the, the building that was called the theater, right? Which is, if you were looking at a map of London, you know, the Thames were running down here, it has this big old loop, etc. Up here in northeast London, in an area called Shoreditch, um, the father of one of Shakespeare's co-actors, one of the members of the Lord Chamberlain, erected a building that he named the Theater. Original, right? He did it on property that was leased. So the property was leased, but the building itself belonged to to Burbage, the father. In 1599, the lease came due. So, the Lord Chamberlain's men, whether it's themselves or they hire workers, they take the theater apart. They literally disassemble it. And they take it, so here's the Thames, they take it down south of the Thames River, in the area of Southwark, you know, with Chaucer and met at the Tabard Inn in the area of Southern, and they rebuild it. And they rename it. It's now the Globe. All right? 
<clears throat> in an area of other theaters. There's a reason the theaters are relocated or built south of the Thames. It's no longer in London City jurisdiction. Right? In the mid 1590s, you had a plague breakout in London. Not massive, not like the Black Plague of you know, the Middle Ages, but enough that theaters were closed. So actors, they couldn't act in London. South of the Thames, they could, because the Lord Mayor of London had no authority there. The only person who could close those theaters is the Crown. Right? And Elizabeth liked the theater. In fact, there's anecdotal evidence Shakespeare writes one of his plays solely to please her, Merry Wives of Windsor, which features the character Falstaff, who is a character in Shakespeare's Henry IV plays. It's all about Falstaff trying to get into bed with the Merry Wives of Windsor. Okay? So they rebuild the theater. I should add up here. Yeah. 1601, his father dies. Right? And it's beginning right around 1600 to about 1605. Man, Shakespeare's just turning out tragedies. Othello, Lear, Macbeth, you know, all these major ones. 1609, the sonnets are published. They're not published by Shakespeare. He, he has no, as far as we know, he has no direct hand in their publishing. And I didn't mention it, but in 1590, <clears throat> In 1598, we have reference to Shakespeare as being a sonneteer, a writer of sonnets. Now, sonnets became big beginning in the mid-1550s. Sonnets, 14-line poem with a specific rhyme scheme. Right? They were invented by an Italian poet named Petrarch in the 13th century, I believe it is. Petrarch, Petrarch wrote sonnets to his kind of imagined lover, Laura, right? To and about her. And he invented all these images, such as the lover is so in love with the girlfriend that he sighs all the time, and his sighs cause winds that destroy the crops. And if she frowns at him, he freezes and or he cries, and his cries create rivers that drown the world. So you have all these kind of exaggerated emotional conceits to them, right? So sonnets become big, and people start writing all these sonnet sequences. When Shakespeare's writing his sonnets, the, the whole sonnet genre has kind of run its course. But Shakespeare still writes them. But we're going to see when we talk about them, Shakespeare's going to turn the sonnet, in some of the sonnets, he's going to turn the sonnet convention on its head. So where you're supposed to praise your lover's, you know, beauty. The idyllic version. The golden hair, the fair skin, the ruby red lips, the white teeth, the white breast, etc., etc. Right? Shakespeare's going to have a couple where he does exactly the opposite. He's going to talk about black crinkly hair, wire-like hair, dark complexion, foul breath, you know, the whole nine yards. He does it for a reason we can talk about. Um, so 1612 is when the globe burns down. Production of one of the plays, they fire a cannon. They've got, they fire a blank in the cannon, not an actual shot. And some of the wadding comes out, lands on the roof of the globe, <clears throat> burns it to the ground. The original of that globe was just discovered, oh, in the last 25 years or so. That is the original foundation. If you go to London today and you go to Shakespeare's globe, you're not going to where the original globe was. The original globe is about, I'm trying to remember the direction, 400 yards east of that. It's under a big old apartment block. But you can go down and see like the foundations of it. If you ever have an opportunity to go to London, go to the club. It's the greatest actors in the world, Hollywood's nothing. 
greatest actors in the world act on the globe theater. Okay? So it burns down. 1616, Shakespeare dies. And in 1623, the first folio is published. The first folio, I've got a copy of it in my office. I'll try to remember to bring it. It's a big old book, uh, that tall by that wide by that thick. It's the collected edition, so to speak, of Shakespeare's plays. It's not all of them. Not most of them, but not quite all of them. Very, very, very important book, all right, in the terms of the history of English literature and all this kind of stuff. It's produced by his fellow actors that had been part of the Lord Chamberlain's men. By the way, I should mention, in 1603, Lord Chamberlain's men become the king's men. King James becomes their patron. Right? <clears throat> so, these fellow actors um, put together this collection and it's, you know, it has a preface, it has introductory poems, we're going to read one by Ben Johnson, celebrated epitaph on Shakespeare. Right? Um, and then his wife dies the same year. Right? So, very, very brief, broad overview. In, I'm sure I don't have it in here. In the sonnets, the sonnets begin, I'll have to, I'll have to send you guys a copy of this. The sonnets begin with a letter, an epistle to the reader. If you can prove, I mean prove, without a shadow of a doubt, conclusively, who wrote the epistle and who the epistle is referring to, you could name your chair of English literature at any university in the world. I mean that literally. You could, if, if you could prove so that the, all the world Shakespeare experts go, you're in. You could say, okay. I want a chair in my name at Oxford. You would get it. Or Harvard, or, you know, wherever. Why? Because this little introductory letter is very enigmatic. It talks about, you know, it has initials of names, and we're not sure who they refer to. Okay? We're not even sure who wrote this thing. We don't know if it's Shakespeare's letter, or if it's the printer's letter. It, it could be either. See, the problem with Shakespeare... We have none of his plays or his poems in his own handwriting. Uh, the poet we're going to read in a couple weeks, John Dunn, we have a poem, a letter, it's a small verse letter, in his own handwriting. So we, we know what it looks like. And we have regular letters to his stepfather in his handwriting when he was three years old, right? Shakespeare, we don't. We have six different signatures by Shakespeare, wills and legal documents, and he spells his name three different ways. Okay? Um, and that creates a problem for some people. For the, what are called, Anti-Stratfordians. The Anti-Stratfordians are people who don't think that William Shakespeare of Stratford-on-Avon wrote the plays. They think that primarily because they don't think some yokel from Woodbury who didn't have a university education could write these plays. See, Shakespeare, at best, from what we know, had essentially a sixth grade education. Now, you gotta qualify that. Sixth grade in his day. So, through about the age of 12, what's the difference between education in Shakespeare's day and education in 2021? Beginning around the age of six, he would have started to learn Latin and Greek. 
in the public school system. And you can go to that school today. King Edward VI Grammar School in Stratford. It's usually closed during the summer. Um, my family and I speak to my Harry Potter course one summer. We were there and they had it open. First time I'd been there, we'd been open. So we went through, you can go in the main classroom. They'll tell you where, according to anecdotes, Shakespeare sat in his right, kind of where Livy is hidden in the classroom. And there's carving on the desk and stuff. And that'll be, you know, Will was here, kind of way. Um, you know, go to the room that supposedly was his the whole nine yards. Okay. But the education was, you know, you start with Latin and Greek and you continue it. And if you've gone on to the university, it would continue again. Ben Johnson in that epitaph is going to say, though he had little Latin and less Greek. Well, the anti stratfordians take that to mean Shakespeare didn't know very much Latin and Greek. They then assert, and because of that, he couldn't have written the plays. Because many of the sources of the plays are clearly in Latin. Right? And because there's use of Latin in the play, in some of the plays at least. All right? um, there's no good proof that suggests Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare. Lots of books that, that follow this. I don't mean necessarily scholarly books. A lot of popular fiction, if you saw the film Anonymous, it was all about Shakespeare not being Shakespeare. You know, Kit Marlowe, Christopher Marlowe, etc. was Shakespeare. Okay. All that's background. Let's start looking at some of these songs. So I asked you, I added to the syllabus the first one. Okay. Now, very briefly, there are 154 sonnets in Shakespeare's sonnet sequence. All right? 154 times 14 lines. That's a lot of lines of poetry. He also had four long poems over 500 lines each, okay? So, four long poems and at least 37 plays. And he wrote all of that, it's fairly safe to assume, roughly in a period from 1590 to about 1612, 22 years. Just take, take the poetry all out and just look at the plays. 37 plays over 22 years. That's roughly a play and a half a year. Okay? A Shakespearean play and a half a year. It would be one thing to write one of these plays. And he's just turning them out. Right? So whoever this author was, and I you know, will make it very clear. I think it's the guy from Stratford because there's linguistic evidence within the plays, dialect, things like that, terms. Pretty make it clear. Um, genius. Okay? Just sheer genius. So look at number one. <clears throat> from fairest creatures we desire increase, that thereby beauty's rose might never die. But as the riper should by time decease, his tender air might bear his memory. But thou, contracted to thine own bright eyes, feeds thy light's flame with self-substantial fuel, making a famine where abundance lies, thyself thy foe to thy sweet self too cruel. That's the end of line eight. Thou that art now the world's fresh ornament, and only herald to the gaudy spring, within thine own bud buriest thy content, and, tender churl, makest waste in niggardine. Pity the world, or else this glutton be, to eat the world's dew by the grave and thee. In a Petrarchan sonnet, I mentioned Petrarch earlier. Petrarchan sonnet is constructed of an octave and a sestet. Lines one through eight. I think it's about 36. 
10, 9 through 14. All right? At the end of line 8, you get what's called the volta. That means a turn, a shift in emphasis. Often it's a kind of a, a contradiction is introduced, like a but or however or something like that. Shakespearean sonnets aren't constructed the same way, or English sonnets. They're constructed of three quatrains with one of three different possible rhyme schemes, okay, and a final couplet. The couplet is usually the summation. It's like da 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 da. -da therefore, okay. Now Shakespeare, who writes this kind does often, and, and notice, there's still 14, okay, three quatrains, 12 lines, plus two, 14 lines. Shakespeare does often still like to do this volta in it. He likes to introduce, after line eight, this turn, a shift of direction. So, look at the first quatrain. From fairest creatures we desire increase, that thereby beauty's rose might never die. But as the riper should by time decease, as tender air might bear his memory. What are we being told? What? Why do we want beautiful creatures to reproduce? Because that's what the first line means. Fairest creatures, beautiful creatures, we desire increase. We desire more of them. And he says we want this for what reason? So that there will all so that there will always be beauty in the world. That thereby beauty's rose might never die. But as the riper should by time decease. What happens to a rosebud that you clip off the stalk? Well, for a couple days, the bud will open, will bloom. But as time goes on, what happens? It deceases. It stops existing. It rots and corrupts. But as the riper should by time decease, his tender air might bear his memory. That is, whose thing is? It's the riper. It's the the beautiful thing that reproduces will what? As time makes the beautiful thing decease. The air will increase. Right? Put that in real world terms. He's saying, the speaker is saying, we want, let's use the, the, the human subject, we want beautiful people Beautiful couples to have children. Why? Because as those couples age and get decrepit, their children will rise up and be beautiful in their stead. So beauty will continue. But thou, who's the thou? Who's being addressed? We have no idea. Okay. And we could even say throughout all, all 154 sonnets. We don't know with certainty if the speaker of the sonnets is addressing a real individual or if it's all totally fictional and imaginary. Now, there are Shakespeare scholars who will tell you they know who the sonnets are addressed to. They know who the sonnets are about. The sonnets are either about a golden-haired youth G-H-Y, if you want, okay. A dark lady, and or both. Why? Because we're going to hear references to a young man who has curly blonde hair. And from Sonnet 127 following, we're going to hear referred to a dark-skinned lady. We are pretty sure who the dark skinned lady is. All right, we'll talk about that when we get to it. So, but
but thou contracted, that is, reduced to just your bright eyes. Feeds thy lights flame with thy self-substantial fuel. Self-substantial. Burden on itself. Right? Making a famine where abundance lies. Thyself, thy foe, to thy sweet self too cruel. What's the speaker saying? You who have kind of gorgeous eyes aren't doing what? You are contracted within yourself. The, the individual being addressed is not sharing the beauty. We don't know if the speaker, if the individual is male or female. But whether male or female, he or she isn't reproducing. Right? That's why, you know, the fuel is being burned inside. It's not talking about masturbation or anything like that. It's just saying the beauty that's there isn't being shared and reproduced. Thou that art now the world's fresh ornament. And your gloss tells you fresh means unspoiled. Okay. What's an ornament? A decoration. It's something that increases beauty, right? Okay. So thou increases the beauty of the world and only herald to the gaudy spring. What is a herald? That's something that announces something else. Look at your footnote for five. Only chief herald to the brightly colored, but not in the modern pejorative. We, you know, we think gaudy today is you know, Elton John. Just no fashion sense. This means to the beautiful, appropriately colored spring. Right? Like spring gets its beauty from this individual. This person is the model for beauty. Within thine own bud, like rosebud, buriest thy content, thy your gloss, contentment. Yeah. Makes it the noun, right? Thy contentment, also essence. You keep within your own bud your essence. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your essence and tender churl, tender, beloved churl. Now, it's not saying the speaker isn't saying the individual being spoken to is the lowest level of society. The speaker is using churl in the other kind of pejorative sense someone who wastes something, someone who doesn't take appropriate measure of something. And tender churl makes waste in niggardine. Niggardine means what? To be niggardly means you're cheap. You, you don't spend what you can. You don't buy the best. You, you're Scrooge. Okay? So how does it make waste in being chintzy? Not spending the beloved's wealth. Not spending what one has. Not monetarily, bodily spending. Not using one's bodily beauty to make more of it. Conclusion, right? Summation, final couplet. Pity the world. That is, show pity to the world. Or else this glutton be. Or be a glutton. What's gluttony? Is it merely eating to excess? No. It's not sharing what one has. It's keeping everything to oneself. Or this glutton be to eat the world's due. That is to eat what you owe to the world. How? By the grave in thee. Because what's the grave going to do? What's the grave do to everyone? It swallows them up. In the footnote nine. What should belong to the world will be consumed first by yourself. How? By not spending it and by death. Right? 
So the first sonnet kind of gives us a first major theme. <coughs> Reproduce. Share beauty. It's not share like here, let me give you this picture. It's share your beauty. All right? Look at Sonic 2. When forty winters shall besiege thy brow, and dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field, thy youth's proud livery so gazed on now will be a tattered weed of small worth healed. They run. Then, being asked where all thy beauty lies, where all the treasure of thy lusty days, to say within thine own deep sunken eyes, where an all eating shame and thrift must praise. How much more praise deserved thy beauty's use if thou couldst answer? This fair child of mine shall summon my count and make my old excuse, proving his beauty by succession thine. This were to be new made when thou art old, and see thy blood warm when thou feelst it cold. All right? So, do we get any better indication of who the intended audience is, of who the recipient of the poem is, or the recipient of the sentiments by the speaker? Male, female? When 40 winters, we've got a gloss, number signifying many and a Shakespeare sign corresponding to late middle age. 1564 to 1616. Shakespeare was 52 when he died. Right? So, when 40 winters, notice besiege. What does that mean to besiege something? To attack. When they attack your brow, your forehead, and do what? Dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field. Wrinkles. Thy youth proud livery, that is, the metaphorical clothing your body wears now. Right? Why is it metaphorical? Because it's talking about the complexion. It's talking about the build of the body. In youth, as opposed to when 40 years old, thy youth proud livery so gazed on now. Dad's telling us, the speaker is saying, when the person being addressed walks into a room, what does everybody do? Turn and look. Whoever it is, is beautiful, gorgeous. It will be a tattered weed of small worth hell. They're going to look at you and when you're 40 and go, man, what happened? You know, bear in mind, this is long before plastic surgery. It's not before cosmetics. There were cosmetics that Shakespeare deals an awful lot with in this time. Then, that is when you were 40, being asked where all thy beauty lies. <laughs> that's a way, that's a, a kind of a polite way of saying, dude. What happened to you? I mean, think of an actor, maybe. An actor who's in a, you know, his or her 50s, 60s, 70s now, compared to when he or she was in 20s or 30s. I mean, okay, there are some actors who, and actresses, who seem to get better and better. Before he died, my wife would still say, Sean Connery at 70, just, you know, drop dead gorgeous. Um, you've got, not you've got mail. When Harry met Sally, what's her name? Anybody know? You guys are going to make me want to do that. I can't think of her name. Real, Meg Ryan, in her 20s, really, really cute. She's not, you know, shaming or anything. She's just not as cute as she used to be. Okay? That's what he's getting at. When you get older, people are going to look at you and go, what happened? Right? They're going to ask, 
where's all the treasure of your lusty, lusty here doesn't mean sexually lusty. It just means pleasure-loving days. Where's the treasure? What did you earn? What did you gain from those wonderful days when you were young? To say, that is to respond to that question, oh, look in my eyes. That's where it is. That were an all-eating shame. All eating, that is, eating you up and thriftless. Thriftless. It bears no wealth. It has no real essence. You've got a gloss there. Wasteful or unprofitable praise. Why? If it's wasteful or unprofitable, what does the speaker say you should do with the beauty you have when you have it? This is kind of introducing, hasn't made it explicit yet. Carpe diem idea. How many of you have seen Dead Poets Society? If you've seen Dead Poets Society, you can never forget this phrase. Seize the day. All right? Use your youth while you may. That's another quote we're going to read later on. Why? Because once it's lost, you may forever tarry. So, how much more praise deserve thy beauty's use if thou couldst answer? How much more praise would you get if you could answer? Here's my beauty. Look at my child. This child of mine shall sum my talents. It is the total of my using my beauty in my youth. And it will make my old excuse. How? Proving his beauty by succession thine. And I think that's the indicator of the gender slash sex of the person being addressed. His to his. Because you don't normally, you don't speak of a son and say, oh, looks just like her. With one, you know, huge exception. Look at a picture of Elizabeth Hurley and look at her son. It's spooky how much he looks like his mother. I mean, really, really spooky, right? This, this were to be new made when thou art old. And see thy blood warm when thou feelest it cold. If you could look back when you're 40 and point to your son, who's maybe five, maybe ten, maybe twenty, and say, this makes me feel alive. Shakespeare's day, it was a commonplace. It was thought, believed. The older you get, what happens to your blood? Anybody know? The older you get, the colder you get. By cold, Blood is kind of like bacon grease. You know, you throw a slab of bacon in the frying pan, you heat it up, and what happens? The bacon cooks, and the cold lard that is part of the bacon melts, right? And you can do this with the pan, and the grease sloshes back and forth. That, that's how old you guys are. Your blood is like that bacon grease. It's hot, man. It's just bubbling inside you. Me, it's like the bacon grease has been sitting there for a couple of days. What's it do? It hardens. It gets congealed. And the older and older you get, the reason you move kind of slower and slower is because the grease is hardened. He says, it'll do what? It'll warm your blood. It'll make you feel alive again. All right? Look at 18. One of Shakespeare's, or possibly Shakespeare's, most famous sonnets. If you have a book, you know, 100 Best Love Poems, this will be in there, automatically. It's in every anthology of love poetry. <clears throat> it's to a man. Right? It's to a man. Now, we don't know, and this is one of the problems of, you know, interpreting Shakespeare's sonnets, we don't know if 
the speaker of the sonnets is supposed to be read as Shakespeare. However, in you know basic kind of intro to literature courses, take 3000, you'll probably be told this. What, what should one never do when reading a poem? What should one never assume? Let me put it that way. That the speaker of the poem is the author. For example, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. You shouldn't assume that the sentiments being said by the wife of Bath are Chaucer's. They are the fictional representation of the wife of Bath. How do we know? Because in the Canterbury Tales, Chaucer tells a tale. That is, the pilgrim, Geoffrey Chaucer, tells a tale, and the pilgrim, Geoffrey Chaucer, is a blithering, blattering moron. But we know the writer, Geoffrey Chaucer, wasn't a blithering, blattering moron. He creates a persona. Every author, every poet creates a persona that is the speaker of that poem. Never conflate the speaker with the author. An awful lot of Shakespeare critics throw that idea totally out the window. And they assume this is Shakespeare. Shakespeare is the speaker for every poem, right? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a day. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dim. And every fair from fair sometimes declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrammeled. So, pause. Can I, should I, compare you to a summer's day? And the speaker eventually says, within those first eight lines, no! Why not? What happened to a summer's day? Well, we're told you, the person being addressed, you're more lovely and more temperate, right? You don't have those really hot days, and you don't have those sometimes cold days. Go to England during the summer. One day it could be 90, the next day it could be 60, right? He says, and summer's lease have too short a date. I'm not going to compare you to a summer's day. Why? Because fall sometimes comes at the end of August in London. Sometimes too hot, the eye of heaven shines. And often the gold complexion is dimmed, fog, clouds. So, and every fair from fair, every beautiful thing from beauty sometimes declines. The beauty falls away. How? By chance? Or nature's changing course? Untrimmed. What does that mean, nature's changing course? What's the constant of life according to the wanderer? Everything here is what? Fleeting, changing, impermanent. Nature's course is change. And what does it do? It untrims. We're getting ready for the Christmas season. People will put trees up in their house. And what do you do with that tree? Or we're getting ready for Thanksgiving. And you'll have Thanksgiving dinner with turkey and all the trimmings. That is, all the other things adjusted to, it, to accompany it. You trim the Christmas tree, which means you decorate it. Notice what's happening here. Nature untrims. Okay. Individuals, beautiful people. You have someone who is beauty with a wonderful complexion, and 20 years later, well, they don't look the same. The face is sagging. The body is sagging. The hair is going gray. But, where we are going? 10 o'clock. All right, we'll pick up with line nine. And... We'll probably spend in two more days on, at least one, maybe two more days on Shakespeare. Um, I put up the other quiz for Chaucer yesterday, uh, Wife of Bath, Tale and Prologue, and I will get the medieval exam up probably today, which will be due Sunday. The 
second, the, the two Chaucer quizzes are due tonight. All right. <clears throat>